What's up, friends? Paul here, and I want to welcome you to the beautiful mess where we talk about tools and tactics to improve your life. Uh, this week, I'm going solo, uh, so I hope you will join me as we discuss. I thought it would be cool if we talk about information overload. Are we getting too much information these days and how to deal with it? Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like there's so much information readily available or that you're being asked to watch or see or be in contact with. And is it too much? So I thought we'd start out with some interesting statistics to kind of put every all this into uh, perspective, um, because as you know, I don't think technology, our use of technology is going away anytime soon. Um, perhaps in the future we'll get smarter on how to use it, but right now, uh, let's be real, on average, people are using technology, at least about half of, I think, Americans or whoever they surveyed on the study, use technology five to six hours a day. Uh, <laughs> that's just insane. You, you put that in perspective, seven days a week, five to six hours a day. I mean, you're, you're spending a whole day on your device. Um, I think that's just your smartphone. So you add in TV, you add in like all these different, you know, you're, you're on your computer already for probably for work uh, as it is. So um, we are in a technology saturated world. Um, what does that mean and how to go from there? So uh, welcome you aboard as... I dive into this with you. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of been where I've been thinking is like, um, and, and there's a lot of great information out there. Uh, I'm going to suggest at least two or three books that you can uh, hopefully dive further into this topic with. Um, for those that are watching the video, I'm going to be looking at some of my notes. So um, if I'm looking at my device, that's what it's for. Um, so here we go. So some, some statistics to put things in perspective. So, um, so digital marketing experts basically found that we're exposed to around 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements each day. That's insane. So I, I think, you know, people say like, oh, it doesn't impact me, but let's be real. When you have 4,000 to 10,000 things trying to get your attention, that makes an impact. And let's be real, like, you know, that 4,000, 10,000 things, what are they trying? They're all trying to get you to do something. So it's like, you know, you already have like a busy life. Let's say you're a mom or, or you know, like you have your kids already yelling at you. Now you have 4,000 to 10,000 extra things that are trying to get your attention and say, buy this, do this, you need this, you know, um, that's insane. So, like, how can you decrease that number one? And then two, like, is there a better way of, you know, I guess like, <laughs> I, I don't know, we, we'll, we'll have to all like go in underground sometime and, and avoid the, uh, maybe go, go camping. That that's, that's the answer. Don't go underground. Okay. And then according to a study that started in 2008, uh, the U S media consumption was an average of 33 gigabytes per day. That's a lot of information, 33 gigs. And then in 2012, a couple of years later, they consumed an average of 63 gigabytes. So that's 2012. We're in 2022. Just imagine how much more, especially with things like TikTok, you know, all this content readily available on your smart device, you know, it's, it's, everywhere. So I can only imagine that that's gone up since then. So this was a study that is from this study or report called How Much Media 2013 Report on American Consumers. Uh, it was produced by the Institute for Communication Technology Management, CTM, at the USC Marshall School of Business and visiting researcher James Short. Um, so yeah, they just studied individuals in and out of the home, excluding the workplace between 2008 and 2015, um, basically looking at how people consumed data. It's, it's just insane to think of how much time people are spending 
consuming information. I just realized on the video stream that I was out of focus. So I don't know how that long that's been, but I'm back back in focus. We'll see. I don't know about you, but you probably realize that you pick up your phone like subconsciously or you start opening up your phone for one reason and you end up using it for something completely different. Uh, I think it's the same with your email. That was probably the first, you know, thing close to your your phone was like, you know, you check your email expecting that dopamine rush of, you know, there's something new, there's something new. It's like you're you're expecting this. And so what they found is that like research is showing that people check their phones about 96 times a day. That's about once every 10 minutes. According to the global tech care company, Asur, Surian, Asurian, Asurian, however you say it. Um, but that that's insane. Like checking your phone that much. I mean, do it now. Like go, I mean, it's probably going to be depressing, but go, go to your, uh, if you have like an iPhone or uh, Android, usually they have like a well-being thing where you can see how much time you're spending on your phone, how many times you picked it up, what are your top used apps. Um, that would probably shed some light on the situation. Uh, let's see here. Oh man, there's there's so much information. I also wanted to talk about this great book. It's called What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. Um, this book is fantastic. Uh, it kind of sheds light on the history of the internet and what it's doing to our brains. Um, I think one of the really fascinating things about this book is it talks about how we learn and that it's done, you know, where you have your short term memory and you transfer that information to your long term memory. Um, However, your short term memory can only hold a certain number of things. And in the book, they describe how in the beginning, like earlier days of studying neuroscience, they thought it was about seven plus or minus two. However, since then, they've realized that it's actually even less than that. They're thinking that it's more like two to four, if that. And so what that means is that as you're coming in contact with information, you can really only hold on to two to four things at a time. And so he he has this imagery of like, you're trying to fill up you know, your long-term memory, thimble by thimble, you know, and so like you've got your little thimble and when you're like using media, like multimedia, you're on a website, you're searching, it's like a fire hose, you know, you have so many things trying to get your attention and your brain, every time it sees a hyperlink or another like image, it has to decide in that moment whether to click it or not. So you're giving away your precious resources to like, do I click on this ad for, you know, a trip to Hawaii? You know, like it's like insane. And they did all these studies. I mean, I could probably, I've got a bunch of them written down here where they like, you know, talk about how they had people try to read things with hypertext, like with little links in the text and then those without. And they, they found that people, you know, one, like they wouldn't be able to like remember as much. Um, and then like, it it just, yeah, it it definitely, okay. So here it says like basically with the hypertext, it imposes a higher cognitive load on the reader. Uh, they did another study where basically, They found that hypertext readers took longer and had more confusion and uncertainty about what they read. And so they they did this other study where like they had two different groups, one where they left in the hyperlinks and another group without those that read the traditional paper documents performed better than the other ones. Yeah. So it's just insane, you know, what that what that does. So this leads us to this question of like, does rich media multimedia where you have like video, you have infographics, you have the, you know, like think of a a news uh, show, you know, you have usually that bar on the bottom sending like this one message, like about something completely unrelated. And then like they're talking about something and then graphics pop up or according to this, it's like cognitive overload. You're like overloading your, your brain. And so what they find is that like when you do like a web binge, like it's all muddled, like you're, you're trying to, you got your little thimble that you're learning, like you're, you're transferring from your short term to your long term. And basically it can only hold so much. So you got your multimedia just like 
you know, it's like this, this big stream. You're, you're got your fire hose and you got this little thimble that's trying to hold it all. And in the end, you know, you can only hold that thimble. So it's going to be a jobbled combination of all these things that you're trying to learn. And so, you know, you just try to keep adding that. But like basically they found that people actually enjoy the process. Let, let me find it here. But they, you know, did that st- did a study where like they had a presentation which had like a series of text pages and then another group watched that same um, presentation but also with like audio visual like extra materials like with related like related materials audio visual and basically they found that those that just had the text found it to be more interesting more educational more understandable, more enjoyable than did the multimedia view- viewers. So I, it, it's quite clear that, you know, according to the data, the simpler it is, the, you know, reading a book, for example, is probably a great thimble by thimble process where you're, you know, learning at a, at a rate that your brain can keep up. Whereas when you bombard it, you know, you flood it with all this information, it's it's not going to be able to keep up. It's, it's going to be overwhelmed, overworked. And then another study, this one's really fascinating. Like I was saying that like the CNN broadcast, they had people watch the CNN broadcast and they found basically that the group, they had one with the regular broadcast with the infographics, the scrolling, you know, news on the bottom. And they found that the people without the extra media elements retained more facts and that the multi-message format exceeded viewers capacity Basically, they were overloaded with information. So think about that as you consume your information. Are you being overloaded? Like, is this too much stimulation for your brain to handle? Because let's be real, you know, it might be cool to get all this information all at once, like jam packed or like, you know, go to your favorite news place and get like all these different things to choose from. from. Um, But you have to realize like in the end, will you actually retain much if any of it so it it definitely you know makes you think again about like how you consume information like and and maybe it's you have to like make that judgment call like am i learning this for a purpose like do i need to study this um if so you might want to choose a different method than maybe you know finding the most uh multimedia rich presentation on youtube you know Maybe you want to just get the the dictionary out of the library or the encyclopedia, as boring as that may be. Also, it's crazy to think about when you read websites, you're actually skimming. Like our brains have started to become more like search engines. So we're looking for the information that's, you know, important to us. So when you look at a website, maybe you pay more attention this time, but what people they found is basically you skim like the letter F. So you skim across the front you scroll down, skim across, and then scroll down. Spending on average, they, they found that people spend about 19 to 27 seconds per page. So I, I think, you know, going back to this, it's it's just insane to think of how much, you know, the internet is at its infancy. I mean, as far as like technology goes, you know, Google is not that old and that's really changing the way we, our, our brains function. Um, they, again, they've done studies and I encourage you to look it up in, yeah, read, read the, what the internet is doing to your brain, to our brains, the shallows by Nicholas Carr. That book, I think dives really deep into that. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating to like learn what the internet's, you know, how that's impacted us, um, as a civilization. But like, think about it. Like now you have access to anything. Like you think about it and you can get it, you know just like that, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, you go through history, how did information pass on? Like originally, you know, it was the people standing around the fire telling stories, you know, they, they had these long form stories that they would share and that would kind of, um, they were able to leave their legacy through spoken word. Uh, and then eventually, you know, the writing became a big part of that. And so they were able to transform those ideas or those spoken word to the page. And, you know, we rely so little nowadays on 
our memory. Like, if it, I don't know if you've realized it or not, but when was the last time you really memorized something? Maybe it was grade school, uh, high school, maybe, you know, now you don't need to memorize that much. It's all there on Google. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm sure it's probably terrible for your brain muscle, you know, your ability to, um, exercise that memorization muscle is probably really good for you so maybe maybe that's something that we need to look further into and like you know sometimes i wonder are we actually smarter than our ancestors or like have we become dumbed down as we adapt technology uh, and it makes life easier for us you know because all of a sudden your brain doesn't have to function the same way that it once did uh, to find food, you know, for example, like that used to be a big problem. Like I can't get food easily. You know, how can I do that? Um, but now like food is readily available. And so we don't have to worry about that, which is a great thing. Um, but then there's other things where like we now, you know, with our smartphones, you know, it's kind of like another appendage to us. Like we, can hardly walk around without this attached to us. And I think we, there's been studies, you know, like whenever it goes missing or it gets broken, you know, you feel it like it's part of your body. Like you, you associate this, you know, phone with your, with you, which is insane. So I I think, you know, what it comes down to is like thinking about, you know, how technology plays a role in our life and is it adding value to your life if not i would say just you know we should we should put it back and and go back to the stone age maybe um but i i don't think that's the case i think it's becoming smarter than the technology and harnessing it and not merely making it a means for those that wish to um you know because obviously money is a driving factor you know social media money is often the determining factor is like your attention is the like what they're selling is for ads and, and stuff like that so i think once we can shift past that you know think more about the long-term effects that technology is having and how will that impact us if we keep you know having this mentality that the money is the driving factor of um how we use technology especially social media um because it is so addictive. I mean, no, no one's going to deny it. I mean, it's, it's addictive. Um, so I think it's, it's important to kind of think of it as like, how can technology serve man? Um, I think of some like simple, like examples, like Google's assistant. I, I love certain aspects of it. I know people have their thing about Google, but Google's assistant is amazing because when you have their Google phone, you can actually have the Google assistant be on hold for you. So no longer do you have to wait on the phone, listening to that great music. Um, they can do that for you. And basically once they have a human on the line, I think they, they connect you or something like that. Or the introvert in me loves that you can have Google assistant answer the phone for you and you can kind of interact with a person. I mean, maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe you're, you're, (laughs) you're taking the human aspect and putting an Android in place of it. But, um, I think there are aspects that can make your life easier, um, and can enrich your life. I mean, I've definitely benefited from technology, being able to reach out to people and, you know, get them on this podcast, for example, um, and to share ideas, you know, across the web. I I think there are so many benefits to it as well. Like it's, it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and just say like, you know, technology is terrible. Um, we're wasting so much time. It's, it's true. I'm, I'm not going to deny it. We're wasting time, but, um, is there a way to make it better? So kind of to recap and wrap things up, uh, the three books that I want to recommend is again, the Nicholas Carr book, the shallows, and then there's, there's a great book and hopefully on another episode, I'll, I'll get to dive into this more is amusing ourselves to death. And so it's the public discourse in the age of show business. And what this one kind of talks about is how um, like medium is message and message is medium and how as you know, the format 
the, the medium changes, that changes the message as well. So with the invention of TV, that changed everything because all of a sudden you had like this certain type of content that worked really well on TV and you had these ads in between. So you have, because, you know, all of a sudden we are 24 seven TV, TV. So they had to find a way to make those segments work. Now you've got TikTok, you've got short form vertical content. That seems to be the thing nowadays. Um, so I think it's important to kind of look at these formats and kind of take a deep dive into like whether it's enriching your life or maybe taking away, um, just becoming more self-aware. And the other book is Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. I think he does a great job about, you know, giving suggestions on how to deal with um, technology. You know, some of it might be more extreme, like on how to approach things. But I, I think he sheds a lot of good, good information on how to live a good digital minimalist life. So yeah, I just want to leave you with some quick takeaways that you can, you know, apply to your life. So one thing that I want to say is like awareness is key. So the first thing would be to take an inventory of how much media you're consuming. Uh, a great place again is your settings, like in the iOS, seeing how much time you spent or in Android, you can also see how much time you spend and see if you're consuming too little or too much. I bet it's too much, not too little, but you never know. Um, consider the quality of the material, like the media, both in form and in material. So like, uh, think about like, obviously there's only so much information that you'll get out of a TikTok video. Sometimes you get those golden nuggets, but most of the time it's like pure entertainment, slapstick, you know, dancing. It's, it's entertaining, but that's probably the majority of what you'll get out of a medium like TikTok. Then find ways to curate the content that comes in contact with you. So find ways to like take that information that you're getting and to make it helpful for you. Maybe you like take a day where you actually like think about what you want to like learn about or media that you want to read or listen to and you kind of create your own class schedule, so to speak, with the information that you want to whether for pleasure or for like learning, um, you can be the, the guide for yourself. Um, and then unsubscribe to any newsletters that you once subscribed to, but you no longer need. So I know you've probably done it where you subscribe to something and you forgot to unsubscribe. So I give you permission, go through your inbox and unsubscribe from anything that's not giving you current value. Uh, you don't have to ask anyone else's permission. You have mine. And then consider reading articles without hyperlinks in reader mode and more traditional books or listening to audiobooks. So again, and, and try not to do multiple things at the same time. That will be very difficult. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm like learning something and like I have the temptation to do something else while I'm doing it or I'm listening to an audiobook and then all of a sudden I want to do something else at the same time. So focus, 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 like you know, hone in on what's important to you and try to like really take a step back. Don't let, you know, the consumer mindset just like take over, like be mindful of your consumption and make sure it's good for you. So I think that's the long and short of it is like, yes, there is content overwhelm, there is overload, but you have the power to determine how you respond to that. It's still within your power. Yes, there are very much addictive elements, but you, you need to set those, you know, boundaries in place if you can to help you succeed. Um, and maybe you determine that it's too addictive and you, you just have to cut it off completely. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm hoping that there's a, a bright future ahead. Uh, if you have any thoughts on this, I'd love to hear from you. Hey, maybe, maybe you want to jump on the podcast again. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you so much for listening to The Beautiful Mess. Until next time, stay messy, my friends. Bye.